it's Adam here for PC Monitors and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Philips 328E1CA. As usual there is a written review which accompanies this video or more to the point this video accompanies the written review and there's a link to that in the description of the video alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. As usual for a video the usual disclaimer applies. What you see does not reflect what you'd actually see firsthand using the monitor. What you see depends on my camera depends on the processing done by my video editing software, by YouTube, and ultimately on the screen you're actually viewing the content on. This monitor uses a 31.5 inch VA panel with a 3840 by 2160 resolution, so that's 4K UHD. More specifically, it uses a Samsung SVA panel, or it's based on a Samsung SVA panel. This has a 1500R curve, and to speak about the curve, first of all, it's something which I find absolutely natural to use. It kind of just draws you into the experience a little bit. Most users will adapt to it quite comfortably. It's something which could be troublesome if you're a designer or you're needing geometric perfection or you just prefer that kind of thing. And some people do just prefer flat screens and that's fair enough. All I'd say is don't judge the curve based on what you can see on a video because there's a kind of weird pincushion effect on the video. It kind of looks like it's squished in in the middle. It's a strange optical effect. Um, when you're actually in front of the monitor using it, that's not something you really notice. It's completely exaggerated in photos and the video. So with that said, the resolution itself, 3840 by 2160, 31.5 inch screen size. I like this combination. I feel it's kind of something of a sweet spot for the 4K resolution, this screen size. And I say that because I can happily use this without any scaling. So I'm just using 100% scaling, that's to say there's no scaling. I don't use application specific zoom. I use the monitor from a distance of around 70 to 80 centimeters. It does depend a little bit on my posture and other things, but so I'm not sitting like miles away from it or anything like that. I'm not sitting particularly close to it. So reasonable distance and I, I can still use it without scaling, but that is quite subjective. Some people will prefer things to look a bit bigger um, and, and even if they can read things, sometimes people just prefer things to look a bit bigger because the icons are quite small and UI elements, text and stuff, it's quite small even if it is readable to me. So if you want to use a little bit of scaling, that's fine, but users will generally find they can get away with less scaling. And um, if they do use scaling, then they would on a smaller 4K model. And the smaller size from this down would be 27 or 28 inches. And there's certainly a difference in readability on this one. But the pixel density is still nice and high, so you get a nice crisp look to images, a nice detailed look to images, and suitably high resolution content such as games. And it gives you a good amount of real estate on the desktop. That's useful for multitasking. So here, for example, I've got a Word document open, and you can see that it naturally wants to fit sort of four pages-ish on the screen, and that's just with half the screen. And then to the right, I've got a web browser, Google Chrome, displaying my website. And you can completely browse the internet at the same time. Procrastinate if you prefer, whilst also working on an important document. Or if you prefer, you can just focus on your work and then you can have a huge spread with lots of different pages all at the same time. And the text there is nice and crisp, very readable. So it's the screen size itself, it's certainly worth talking a little bit about that. Um, it's really very subjective, so there's not an awful lot I can say about that. But I would say that I do like the screen size. I find it quite immersive. So it's obviously not as wide as an ultra wide screen. Uh, well, not obvious, but it's obvious to me because I've tested a lot of different screens of various sizes. It isn't as wide as a 34 inch ultra wide, but it's certainly wider than a 27 inch 16 by nine model and it has more height as well than a 34 inch ultra wide or indeed a 27 inch 16 by nine model. So they're similar heights, whereas this is, has extra vertical real estate or vertical screen space, I should say. So I do find it quite immersive and I feel that it makes quite good use of the curve as well. Sort of the combination, it does sort of draw you into the experience a bit and I quite like that. But again, it's very subjective, a very individual thing. Some users might find this a little bit overwhelming at the size and it might take some getting used to if you're used to a much smaller screen. Personally, I can use actually much larger screens than this on my desk and I adapt them quite readily. It does sometimes take a bit of time depending on what I've come from, but I do think that um, there's something to be said for sort of getting used to things. And I think that most users can adapt to the screen size and actually quite like it. 
when they have. The screen surface, that's something I always like to comment on, particularly earlier on in the video. That is light matte anti-glare on this model, quite typical for a modern VA really. And it doesn't have the smoothest look I've seen from a screen surface, but it doesn't have an obtrusive level of graininess either. So it does keep things looking reasonably smooth. There's a little bit of graininess, but it's sort of what I describe as a misty graininess rather than a heavy or smeary graininess. And this is something I'm particularly sensitive to. It's the kind of level of graininess you're talking about here. It's not something that most users will actually notice um, or find bothersome. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. So as you can see, it has a fairly smart look, a business-like look, a kind of home office look if you prefer. Matte black plastics used extensively on the interestingly shaped stand base and also the bottom bezel there. The central silver-coloured Philips logo and the stand neck is also silver-coloured and that's actually powder-coated metal. The OSD controls are there, that's explored in a separate video, buttons on the underside. The top and side bezels, they have a dual stage bezel design, or three sided borderless if you prefer to call it that. So there's a slender panel border around the image, which is difficult to get the camera to focus on, but you can probably just about see it. It sort of blends in quite well to the rest of the screen and it's flush with the rest of the screen. Then there's a hard plastic outer component around that. The screen itself is curved, which is explored elsewhere in the review, and in pictures and videos, especially if you move around, this curve looks quite exaggerated, really. But when you're actually using the monitor, it's something that most users will readily adapt to. I certainly did. I find it quite natural using this kind of monitor. And the curve is a little bit steeper than on some models. The curve is 1500R, so it is a moderate curve. But as I said, I explore that elsewhere, so I don't need to repeat that here. The screen surface is a light matte anti-glare, so that gives Good glare handling and also keeps the image free from obvious graininess. There's a bit of a grainy look to lighter shades as I explore elsewhere, but not a kind of strong, heavy or smeary graininess, thankfully. From the side, the monitor has a reasonably slender look, at least it's reasonably slender at the thinnest point, then it lumps out centrally. And it can look a bit strange um, from this angle, not that you really tend to look at monitors from this angle. And it's because of the curvature as well, it makes it look a little bit weird. But you can also see the stand design, so it attaches there towards the bottom and it doesn't offer much ergonomic flexibility, you can only tilt the screen backwards and forwards a bit. So you can tilt the screen backwards and you can tilt it forwards very slightly, but it's not a height adjustable stand, you can't swivel it and you can't pivot it. At the rear, there's black plastic with a brushed effect, a brushed texture. It's matte black plastic. There are central 100 by 100 millimeter VESA holes for alternative mounting, if you didn't like the stand I was just talking about there. And there's also a little cover around the stand, so it just sort of keeps it looking neat so there aren't exposed screws or anything like that. But if you remove that cover, it's easy to do, you just sort of slide a flathead screwdriver or something like that in there, then you can clip that off remove the stand and use your alternative 100 by 100 millimeter VESA solution instead. There's also a case slot towards the bottom right and there are the ports at the back facing backwards. There are two HDMI 2.0 ports, there's display port 1.2a and there's an audio input 3.5 millimeter and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack as well plus an AC power input which means that the monitor has an internal power converter and doesn't use a power brick. Adaptive sync is supported on this model via HDMI and DisplayPort, and that means you can use AMD FreeSync, and as an NVIDIA user using DisplayPort at least, you can also use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. I don't always mention that this early on in the review, because it's not something I've always tested by this point, but, but you're know, quite lucky because I've already tested that on this model before recording this bit of the video. And just quickly, something I forgot to mention earlier, there are some speakers, you can see a speaker grill there and another one there. So they've, so there are down firing speakers, two three watt speakers. They offer reasonable sound output. I explore that a bit in the written review. I'm not really an audiophile or someone who really spends much time reviewing that kind of thing, 
but I've used quite a few integrated speakers and this model has quite decent integrated speakers really. I'm now going to talk about the contrast performance and to start off because this is a VA panel I'd like to talk about something called Black Crush and that can be easier to demonstrate the effect of this using out of game examples. So there's Legom, legom.nl. I'm using the black levels test here to demonstrate this. And with the VA model, there's a kind of cone, if you like, in the middle of the screen or a central area in the middle of the screen. It's not necessarily in the middle of the screen. It's actually the bit of the screen that you're looking at directly so that your eyes are directly in line with. And the perceived gamma here is much higher than elsewhere in the screen. And specifically for the low end, it's much higher. And this means that dark shades appear darker than they should, and they sort of blend into a black mass. It masks detail in dark areas, that kind of thing. So with these Legon blocks, again, this isn't represented as you'd actually see firsthand on the video, but it does show the relative effect. You can see they're far more blended here, for example, than if I shift my view slightly. You can see they are revealed, the top row there, more clearly versus centrally. And if you move your head around even slightly when you're observing shades like this, the tone really does shift very readily. That isn't just the camera compensating for things, although the camera does do that. It's actually something you can observe firsthand as well. So that the level of detail does depend on which bit of the screen you're looking at. And I will give some in-game examples because it is nice to give in-game examples as well. But I just thought I'd show you this and um, sort of help set the scene for, the, for when I'm talking about Black Crush. This is what I'm referring to. I'm now going to talk about contrast performance using some in-game examples. So I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider here. This title has plenty of high contrast scenes. There are lots of dark caverns and dark passageways, tombs, that kind of thing, with lots of dark content. There's some little sort of point source of illumination, like fire here, for example. Being a VA model, this monitor does provide a nice look to that kind of scene, and certainly better than you'd see on a non-VA LCD. If you're sitting in a dark room, I'm sitting in a pretty dark room now, for example, you're not going to see inky blacks, you're not going to see really deep dark shades, that kind of thing, because you don't see that from any LCD without a fancy local dimming backlight solution of some sort. But what you do see is a much better depth to these darker areas and a much more atmospheric look than you'd get on non-VA panels. And actually, as far as VA panels go, the contrast of this is, I'd say, somewhere in the middle. Most modern VA panels, they go up to around 3,000 to 1 if you're lucky. Some I'll record a little bit beyond that, some a bit below. This one, using my test settings, I recorded about 2,500 to 1. And that's actually bang on what's specified for the panel. So that's not disappointing at all. That's actually very good. And indeed, if you have all of the colour channels in the neutral position, which optimises contrast, you can actually get close to 3,000 to 1. But I wouldn't really worry about... I wouldn't really worry about the numerical difference there. The experience overall is, is very similar. And as I said, good atmosphere to Tomb Raider here and, and, and darker elements like those shown here. The bright elements like the fire as well stands out really nicely. And on the video, I know it sort of just appears largely like a big sort of bloom of light. But in reality, you can see distinctive details on the fire. It's not just sort of bleached out like it looks on the video. As a VA panel, there is Black Crush, which I mentioned before, and it's always difficult to sort of show examples of this on a video, and that's why I showed you Legom earlier. But if you look sort of up here, there's a dark mass there, and the details there are more masked than they are if you view the same content further out towards the peripheral sections of the screen. This can also be difficult to show on a game because different camera angles can sort of change how the game renders things as well. But in this case, there are some changes depending on where you're looking at the content on the screen. But don't despair. The black crush I'm showing you here and the black crush on this model, it's about as low as I've seen on a VA panel. There are certainly examples which with much stronger black crush than that, and it is a VA characteristic. It's inescapable to have it to some extent. On this model, it's really as slight as I've seen. So I wouldn't worry about that. I don't think it really breaks the atmosphere or anything like that. It just ebbs away a little bit of the subtle detail. But really there are some quite decent fine details and this kind of loss of detail is not the same as you'd get, for example, higher up on a, on a TN panel. So higher up on TN panel, towards the top, things would look 
really dark, really blended together, and perceived gamma is extremely high. Lower down, things actually look quite flooded on TN models in general. Um, certainly compared to the top, the perceived gamma is way, way lower. And that means that you get an excess of detail, so that introduces banding effects. These sort of things that exist in the content, but should be sort of more masked than they are on TN models towards the bottom. This doesn't have that kind of inconsistency. Yes, it does have the black crush centrally, as I've shown you. Um, but even with the black crush, there are these porous rock textures on Tomb Raider, which let you know that rocks can actually be climbed, that they're climbable surfaces. And on TN models towards the top, particularly larger TN models, the viewing angle weaknesses are sufficient to actually mask that kind of detail. But on this, even centrally, it isn't masked and you can still see it. It's fainter than it should be. So it is masked in, in the sense of uh, being less distinct than it should be, but it isn't masked in the sense of being invisible. The aspect of contrast really, that is to consider the lighter shades. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a little bit of graininess to the screen surface, but nothing strong, nothing smeary. It doesn't have a kind of sandpapered look. Some models, particularly those with high resolutions, high pixel densities, it actually can kind of exaggerate this effect, give it what people would call a crystalline effect or a sandy look. This model doesn't really have that. It does have what I call a kind of misty graininess. And it isn't just because I'm looking at some mist on the mountain there. It's uh, very appropriate when I'm talking about misty graininess. But it's, it's, just, it's just an effect of the screen surface. It's something I'm very sensitive to. So I will pick this up. I do notice it, but I don't find it overly bothersome on this model. So most users should be just fine. Now back to the darker content, there is VA Glow. That's a characteristic of VA panels as well. This isn't anything like IPS Glow. It doesn't have the same kind of effect where you'd get an obvious eating away at detail towards the bottom of the screen from a normal viewing position. And that would really fill out a lot of the screen and really break the atmosphere. It's far more subtle than that. And on this model, it's actually a relatively minor level of VA Glow that it has. You can see towards the corners of the screen and particularly the bottom from a, a normal viewing position. I've actually got the camera mounted a little bit above centre to try and sort of simulate the ergonomically correct viewing position of, of how this might present itself. But I do have to say the camera does actually exaggerate this effect. I don't see it as strongly to my eye at all. And um, particularly further up the screen, I can't really see that kind of, it actually looks very dark. It doesn't sort of have this haze effect as you see on the video. But lower down, there is a little bit of that. It's not as extreme as it's shown there. You do get a bit of lightening of the dark content there from the VA Glow. But really, yeah, this is, but really, yes, this is very minor compared to IPS Glow. I can still see a lot of detail and the overall atmosphere is good, especially compared to IPS type panels and even TN models with much weaker contrast than those kind of vertical differences I described earlier. Moving on now to colour reproduction. And as usual, I like to start this off with Legom. That's legom.nl the website and their tests for viewing angles. And that's because this can help highlight some issues which aren't always obvious, especially in a video when you're showing a game. So the first aspect, the, the GOM text, the Legom text test, ideally that would appear a blended gray throughout the screen and there wouldn't really be any sort of distinct colors to the striping of the text. On this model, it's a VA model. So there are some weaknesses in terms of color consistency and viewing angle performance. What you get is quite a blended look centrally, and this is clearer if you're quite close to the screen. So this is sort of what I'd consider a normal viewing position. And you can see further out, there's a kind of red tint to the striping. It then kind of becomes more of an orange, whereas centrally it's quite blended with a slight green look to it. And it is a bit like that further up as well. And it does depend on your viewing position. So this sort of cone, this may be reminding you of the black crush I was talking about earlier. It's the same kind of thing, uh, it's the same kind of perceived gamma change which causes this. So this does indicate some weakness in terms of the viewing angle dependency of the, the gamma curve of the monitor. But that's typical for VA models and actually some VA models, particularly of this size, would show more extreme shifts than this. And they'd have a far more colourful sort of red look towards the edge and the blended area would be perhaps a bit smaller, that kind of thing. So this model, as far as VA models go, is quite good just on this particular test. Perhaps it's easier to imagine the effect of this by looking at solid shades like this though. 
So this is a slightly bluish purple shade, or it should be a slightly bluish purple shade. And centrally and towards the top of the screen from a normal viewing position, it is. Whereas towards the edges of the screen, it has more of a pink hue. This doesn't always come out properly on the video. It sort of mixes things up a little bit, but you can see the pink hue shifting as you move your head. So particularly from a more extreme viewing angle, you can see it becomes very pink indeed. The red block looks a good vibrant red throughout the screen really, but it's a bit more of a pastel shade towards the bottom and the side, but particularly the bottom of the screen, sort of more, more of a faded red, slightly pinkish hue, more saturated further up the screen and, and towards the middle in particular. And these shifts do become more pronounced if you're closer to the screen. As I mentioned earlier, I like to sit around 70 to 80 centimeters from the screen if I can, a little bit closer depending on my posture. But if you're sitting sort of 50 centimeters from the screen or really much closer than 60 centimeters, these kind of shifts can certainly be more pronounced. So you can now see it looks quite a deep saturated red further up the screen, more faded further down. And as you move back, as long as you as long as you're keeping quite central, that kind of shift reduces. The green block looks a good vibrant colour, technically a saturated green chartreuse colour. Throughout the screen, a little bit of yellowing, and that really is dependent on the colour gamut. A wider colour gamut would tend to make the shade look a sort of purer green, um, or have less yellowing, I should say. And this does have a bit of extra yellowing, uh, towards the bottom of the screen and again towards the extreme edges, but it's fairly subtle really, quite consistent, this shade. Blue, really no complaints here. It's really quite a solid blue. Slightly sort of duller looking towards the very bottom of the screen um, and, and actually a little bit brighter towards that edge, a little bit dimmer towards that edge, but you know, these are just slight changes in uniformity and that varies between individual units of the same model. So that's not characteristic of this model. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. This monitor offers fairly generous extension beyond sRGB. It isn't as much extension as you'd see on some models. And with HDR being something that's pushed these days, you tend to find that they sort of edge towards DCI P3. This monitor certainly isn't um, really anywhere near covering DCI-P3 fully, but it certainly offers extension beyond sRGB. And to put things into context, sRGB is the what I call the lower or lowest common denominator for colour spaces. It's something which game developers will be targeting for normal SDR content like this. And that's because that's what most devices are capable of displaying, but not necessarily more than that. So if you display content like this designed with the sRGB colour space in mind on a wider colour space or a wider colour gamut, things do have an extra bit of saturation. So that gives them a, a nice vibrant look. So things do look quite vibrant overall. Um, the saturation is technically higher than it should be, but this is an even extra saturation. It isn't the same as when you increase NVIDIA Digital Vibrance, for example, NVIDIA Digital Vibrance Control or increase saturation digitally, as that's called, because what that does is it doesn't expand the colour gamut, it simply pulls things closer to the edge of the colour gamut, and that does give stronger saturation um, of, of the less saturated shades, whereas the more strongly saturated shades, they can only be so saturated, um, because that's dictated by the colour gamut itself. Hopefully that makes sense, and I'm not just rambling here. But basically, it means that the shade variety on this is maintained, so things don't look cartoonish, they don't look weird, they just look a little bit more saturated than they should. And to be honest, I think that gives quite a nice look. It's, it's subjective again, some people like this, some people don't, but really we're quite used to seeing a bit of oversaturation because wider colour gamuts are common, even on our smartphones these days and on TVs, etc. So this is kind of something we've become accustomed to. And if you saw this just with sRGB or a colour gamut that's just very close to sRGB, people would often describe it as washed out looking. And that's, you know, maybe a fair assessment because it is quite a uh, muted palette, really. With that said, vibrant look overall. The autumnal reds here are really nice and a really nice range of autumnal reds and oranges and browns. Good woody tones as well. So these woody tones, they do have a slight extra reddening because of the colour gamut, so they have red hues in them naturally and they're sort of a bit more saturated than they should be. But this is quite 
subtle on this model, certainly compared to models with more generous extension beyond sRGB. And I often comment on this um, in this scene. So the log here, for example, it looks a, bit, a little bit more red and less of a neutral brown than it should, but that's not extreme and it's not to the extent that you get on some models, particularly those with close to sort of DCI P3 color coverage. So it just helps things sort of look a little bit more lively. And as I said, most users will quite like that. There's a nice array of quite natural looking greens as well, sort of golden greens and some lush forest greens, not here because these are sort of autumnal colours, but some areas of this game and various other games show some really nice lush greens. Not as deep and lush as they could be if, if the colour gamut was even wider, but certainly lush and uh, quite natural looking. And the green paint here as well has a nice vibrant quality to it, the red paint there as well. So these vibrant elements really do stand out nicely in sort of a natural way without looking weird and cartoonish. Explosions as well, that was a bit of a stupid idea, just throwing that grenade there, now I'm going to get killed. But um, yeah, just to show you some explosions, some fires on this game, have a nice rich quality to them, some good strong oranges and yellows. And again, slight oversaturation of those colours, but nothing extreme. As I mentioned with Legom earlier, there are some weaknesses in terms of colour consistency, but nothing extreme, certainly not extreme for the panel type at all. So colours do lose a bit of saturation if you view them from a normal viewing position towards the edge of the screen. So I don't know if this will be clear in the video, probably not, but the sort of red hue for this leaf, for example, looks really relatively rich and saturated centrally, becomes a little bit weaker in its saturation further out. But from a normal viewing position, even towards the edge of the screen, it has decent saturation and it doesn't look what I'd describe as washed out. As with Legon, these shifts do depend on how close to the screen you're sitting. So if you're sitting closer, then the shifts are more pronounced, the changes in saturation, just to give you an extreme example. Sort of compare what you're seeing to the right of the image and the right of the video, which is actually sort of the central area of the screen, to displaying that same content further out. So that really exaggerates the effect. So you see the obvious shift from left to right, so from further towards the peripheral section of the screen to the central section. But from further away, the shift is still there to an extent, but really a lot more subtle. And certainly if you're comparing to the shifts you see on TN models vertically, you would get obvious shifts there, or certainly obvious to me, um, and actually to quite a few users. Things really look quite faded towards the bottom, or certainly much less saturated towards the bottom than further up. But as a VA model, these kind of shifts don't occur, and they're far more subtle. And it does affect some shades more than others. It's not universal. It doesn't apply to the same extent to all shades. And I give some examples in the written review of some shades, uh, particularly skin tones and sort of subtle pastel shades, which become sort of a little bit more subtle um, than they should be even towards the edge of the screen, whereas century they appear, if anything, a little more saturated than they should because of the colour gamut. But really these shifts are not extreme and I'm just pointing them out because I like to do a very thorough job, not because I think they're going to bother people. I'm now on Battlefield 5 again, and I'm going to be talking about the responsiveness of the monitor. There's an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness, and that explores various different terms that I'm going to be using here. And there's a very important concept explored there called perceived blur. And this explains that it isn't only the pixel responses which control what the motion on the monitor looks like. It's also the movement of your own eyes. So that's an important aspect of perceived blur as you track the motion on the screen. And it's this aspect that's actually very tightly linked to the refresh rate of the display. So I've got this monitor set to 60 hertz, which is its maximum refresh rate, and it's running at 60 frames a second pretty much consistently. Um, in fact, very consistently you can see my frame rate counter in the top right there. It's very small, but you can see it's displaying 60, a green number. So I'm getting the most out of the monitor, in other words. There is a moderate amount of perceived blur just due to eye movement and linked to the refresh rate because this isn't a high refresh rate monitor, so you don't get that kind of advantage. 
but then you have to consider the pixel responses on top of that, which also affect perceived blur. And that's why I like to use this particular scene on Battlefield 5. It's because it's a scene which has a lot of high contrast transitions, a lot of darker shades and a lot of light shades in the background. So you do get these so-called high contrast transitions or transitions with lots of dark shades, which VA models like this do typically struggle with. This monitor, I have to say, as far as VA models go, is actually rather good. It doesn't have any real standout weaknesses, or at least it doesn't have widespread standout weaknesses. There are certainly some weaknesses, and I'm going to show you some of them. But I've played this game a lot, and in general, I do notice that it's a 60 hertz monitor. Um, and I am aware of the fact it's a VA panel, because there are some weaknesses. But it really doesn't give me that kind of experience that I get with some VA models, where things almost make me feel sick sort of motion sick looking at it and I don't really feel that it gives me a huge competitive disadvantage over much faster 60 hertz models. I do prefer high refresh rates, that's just me um, and that's something various other users would agree with. But as far as 60 hertz monitors go and certainly as far as VA models go, this one's a decent performer. So if you look at the dark area there, the dark wood, against the much lighter background there's a little bit of what I call powdery trailing. It's quite a heavy powdery trail. This means that there's a little bit of trailing behind the dark object, which is beyond what you'd ideally see on a 60 hertz monitor. So that is due to some slower than optimal pixel responses. You can also see that down here with these boats, especially if I move the mouse in a circular motion, sort of makes it stand out a bit better. There's just a bit of extra perceived blur because of some weaker than optimal pixel responses there. But with some VA models, you'd actually see an obvious smear here, um, almost like smoke is coming off these boats here. And that is really much slower than optimal pixel responses. Fortunately, this monitor doesn't show that kind of thing there. There's a little bit of overshoot in places as well, a little bit of inverse ghosting. So to the left of this tree trunk here, as I move, there's a very slight halo trail which is brighter than the background colour so it kind of slightly stands out because of that but it's actually quite well blended as far as overshoot goes and it's quite a low level of overshoot and this is just one specific example it's not widespread on this monitor at all and the overshoot is actually something which probably isn't going to come out in the video because it's quite slight and isn't something that most users are going to find bothersome at all because it is a low level on this monitor some of the weakest pixel responses, and these aren't common on this game and aren't really common on games in general, but they do crop up from time to time. With the white little blob here, and where it says E to pick up a letter, there is what I'd describe as a slightly smeary look to the trailing. It might be described as a heavy powdery trailing, but it does have a bit of a smeary quality to it really. And it stands out because of the contrast itself as well, but these are definitely some slower than optimal pixel responses. The letter on the table as well, the dark letter, the dark red letter against the lighter tabletop, also has this to an extent. And these vases here show a similar thing. It's actually not as extensive on these vases. These transitions aren't quite as slow, but there's a little bit of powdery trailing. But really, as I mentioned before, as far as VA models go, this one isn't bad at all. So if I compare it to, for example, the Philips 4037UW, which is a model which I found really quite horrendous to use, and I really disliked using it. And that's not just because it was a 60 hertz monitor and I prefer high refresh rates. It's because it just had really slow pixel responses and there was smeary trailing all over the place. It was really not nice to use at all. And even users who aren't massively sensitive to that kind of thing would pick this up on that model. This monitor is very different to that. The pixel responses overall are really good for a solid 60 hertz performance. There are some weaknesses, but they're not particularly widespread. And for the panel type, they're not particularly obvious. There are various pixel response time settings, pixel overdrive settings on this model. They're called smart response, as they always are called on Philips models. They're in the picture section of the OSD, you can see smart response there. I like faster, I consider that optimal because as I've shown you, even with the faster setting, there isn't much overshoot. If you increase that to the fastest setting, however, overshoot becomes really obvious, really strong. You can see that very bright halo trailing all over the place. 
not attractive at all. I really don't see how anyone would prefer that to a little bit of some slower than optimal pixel responses in places because it's so eye-catching. And just for completeness, I'll show you the other settings. So there's fast, and the fast setting is not hugely different to faster, but it is just slower in general for these responses that it struggles with, these pixel responses that it struggles with. It does get rid of the slight amount of overshoot behind the tree, for example, but it replaces it with more obvious powdery trailing. And around the flag there, you can see this more clearly, or at least I can see it more clearly, and you can by eye really some much slower than optimal pixel responses. So I definitely would consider the faster mode optimal. And if you completely disable the pixel overdrive, as I said, just for completeness, I would like to show you all of the settings, then things just become a complete smeary mess. So, and, and actually some VA models look like this all the time, even with their much faster overdrive settings. So just to give you an idea of how things can look isn't nice at all. It's like you're drunk when you're playing the game. It's like some weird filters applied. I've now got the monitor set back to my optimal, my preferred smart response setting of faster. And I've increased the graphics settings a bit so that I can talk about adaptive sync, which this monitor supports. That means that if the frame rate drops below 60 frames a second, the monitor is able to adjust its refresh rate dynamically to match that where possible. So you can see that occasionally my refresh rate counter goes below 60, actually quite frequently it goes below 60 because of the settings I'm using at the moment. I have had to ramp things up quite a lot to show you this. And it is really nice to have the tearing and stuttering from these mismatches removed. If you don't have adaptive sync enabled, you do get tearing and stuttering. So if you've got V-Sync disabled, you'd have obvious tearing, or obvious to me and obvious to sensitive users, I should say. And if you had V-Sync enabled, you would have obvious stuttering as the frame rate dropped below that 60 frames a second. And this mismatch, even if it's just one frame a second off from the 60, it really is very obvious to me and, and users who are sensitive to it that this kind of, at least sort of relatively low frame rates, I mean, by relatively low frame rate, I mean compared to what you might get on a high refresh rate monitor, like 100 frames a second plus. At this kind of relatively low frame rate, these issues, tearing and stuttering, are much easier to actually notice. And many users do find them really nasty, so it's really nice having them removed. And more specifically, this monitor supports AMD FreeSync on compatible GPUs and systems. It also supports NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. It isn't certified as NVIDIA G-Sync compatible, but I've tested this on my NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti. In fact, I'm using that right now as I'm recording this video, and it worked exactly the same as FreeSync did on my AMD GPU. But actually my NVIDIA GPU is quite a bit more powerful, so I much prefer using it in general, and it works in much the same way. So the variable refresh rate range is 48 to 60 Hertz. So that means that if the game is running between 48 and 60 frames a second, the monitor will match the frame rate of the content with its refresh rate. If it drops below 48 frames a second, which does naturally happen quite a bit, especially on my AMD GPU, I have to say, or if I'm increasing the graphic settings a lot, so I've got the resolution scale up a lot, um, there will be some drops below that. And when that happens, obvious tearing and stuttering occurs. So I've increased my graphic settings further You'll now see things are hovering around 50 frames a second, but there are some drops when the refresh rate counter goes red, sorry, the frame rate counter goes red, and that means that the technology deactivates. And you might even be able to see this on the video because it's really quite strong stuttering I'm now experiencing around the tree and the flag post. That's because the technology deactivates below 48 hertz. And when it's above that, it goes a lot smoother and this again isn't necessarily so obvious on the video it's very difficult to capture on a video but it's certainly something which is really jarring to me this tearing and stuttering so it would have been nice to have a higher variable refresh rate range really i just see adaptive sync on this monitor as a bit of a bonus really it certainly is useful when you get a little bit of departure from your optimal 60 frames a second and it's also worth noting that as your frame rate drops, you do get a little bit of a drop off in connected feel, as I call it. So that's how the monitor feels when you're interacting with the game world. 
and you also get an increase in perceived blur. But it's not extreme because you're just comparing around 50 frames a second to 60 frames a second, so it doesn't make a massive difference really in, in that sort of range. And unlike some FreeSync models um, or Adaptive Sync models, there aren't really any obvious problems with overshoot as the frame rate decreases because unlike Nvidia G-Sync models, there isn't variable overdrive. You don't have the you don't have the overdrive algorithm retuned for various different refresh rates, as would ideally happen. So sometimes with FreeSync models, you do get really strong overshoot as your frame rate drops. In this case, isn't an issue. Overshoot is pretty much the same at 50 frames a second versus 60, because I mean it's a pretty narrow range to be honest. So there's not much difference which would be needed in terms of the tuning anyway. So it gets away from that one. And before I totally forget to mention input lag, that isn't an issue on this model. It has a low signal delay. I can't remember exactly what I measured off the top of my head. I think it was around five milliseconds. You can check in the written review in the input lag section. But either way, this basically means the signal delay is very low. And even to sensitive users, this particular aspect of the monitor isn't something that's going to be an issue. To wrap up then, the overall design of the monitor, there's nothing particularly exciting there. It just has a fairly smart home office look, really. It doesn't offer any ergonomic flexibility to the stand beyond tilt adjustment, but there are VESA holds at the back if you require alternative mounting. In terms of the contrast performance, really that's the main strength of VA models like this, and this monitor put in a nice performance in that respect. So that helped the atmosphere in dark scenes and games, it helped brighter shades stand out nicely against darker surroundings. There's a little bit of graininess from the screen surface, but nothing particularly extreme and nothing that most users will actually notice, to be honest. It's something I'm very sensitive to, so I don't like to go on about it too much and sort of pretend that it's going to really bother people, because frankly, it's not going to bother most people. It isn't a big issue on this monitor. There is also a bit of VA Glow. It's a VA panel, so as you might imagine from the name, VA Glow is something which does occur on VA panels. There's various different amounts of VA Glow on different panels. On this one, it was pretty average, really. It's actually reasonably low level, perhaps a little bit lower than average. It wasn't a big issue at all. So it didn't break the atmosphere or anything like that, and it certainly wasn't like IPS Glow in that respect. Also characteristic of VA panels, Black Crush. There was a bit of that, but about as little as I've actually seen on a VA model. So that does reduce the detail for darker shades for the section of the screen you're looking at directly, whereas other sections of the screen, so peripheral sections of the screen, the detail levels are more appropriate. But, and this is exaggerated if you're looking off angle as well, so you're looking from an angle. But as I said, it's about as low as I've seen on a VA model, and the overall atmosphere and the overall contrast performance I was quite pleased with on this model. The colour gamut extends a bit beyond sRGB, not to an extreme amount and not as much as some models, particularly those that target DCI-P3 colour space for HDR purposes primarily. This monitor has just a bit of extension beyond sRGB. It's enough to give the image an extra injection of vibrancy, but it doesn't make things look cartoonish, it doesn't make things look strongly saturated. It just basically makes shades look like a slightly more saturated version than intended um, for normal sRGB content. There are some losses of saturation towards the bottom of the screen and the side of the screen, and these are stronger if you're sitting closer to the screen and if you move off angle they become particularly strong. From a normal viewing position, and for a screen of this size, I'd say 70 centimeters plus is reasonable. Really, these shifts are as low as I've seen on a VA model, especially one of this kind of size. So they aren't, they aren't an extreme issue, but still the colour consistency isn't as strong as it is on IPS type models. And for that reason, I wouldn't recommend using this kind of monitor for photo editing. Certainly you can get away with it for hobbyist photo editing, that kind of thing. But at a more professional level, or if really colour accuracy is very important to you, just be aware of these weaknesses in colour consistency, these perceived gamma and saturation shifts. The screen size and the resolution I was very happy with. It's something of a sweet spot really in my opinion. The combination of a 4K resolution and 31.5 inch screen size or around 32 inch screen size. It works very nicely 
I could happily use the full resolution without any scaling. Some users might like to use a bit of scaling. It depends on your personal preferences, your eyesight, various other things. But you'd use a lower level of scaling than you would on a smaller 4K model. So you do end up with a nice amount of real estate. Really nice level of clarity, detail to suitably high resolution content as well. So I certainly like this combination. The screen is curved, it has a 1500R curve, so this is a moderate curve. Added to the size of the screen, it is more noticeable than the curve on some curved models, but it isn't something which really dramatically changes the experience. And as I mentioned elsewhere in the review, there's a sort of pincushion effect when you actually look at pictures of the monitor or videos. But when you actually use the monitor in person, that pincushion effect isn't something you notice. And the overall experience is something which I adapted to quite readily. I've been using this monitor for over a week now, and I'm completely comfortable with the curve. And I feel it's quite natural. It just draws you into the experience a bit, but it doesn't feel uncomfortable at all. And as you'll see on an article on our website all about viewing comfort, um, there are some studies suggesting that a curve like this on a screen can actually be beneficial to viewing comfort. And whether you really like the idea of the curve or you dislike it, I just say, give it a try. Don't dismiss it until you've actually tried a curved monitor like this, because most users are surprised by how subtle it is when you actually use a curved monitor. In terms of responsiveness, it's a 60 hertz monitor. It's a VA panel, so it isn't the most incredible powerhouse in terms of responsiveness. But actually, as far as VA models go, it was quite a good performer. It didn't have widespread weaknesses in pixel responses or really strong weaknesses in pixel responses. There were some issues here and there. There's some slower than optimal pixel transitions. There was no real overshoot to speak of. And actually it did a really decent job at 60 Hertz. Most of the transitions were performed well enough for a really good 60 Hertz performance. So for VA panels, so actually amongst VA panels, this is one of the better performers out there. It also has good low input lag, a low signal delay. So that isn't something you'd have to worry about either. Adaptive Sync was also supported, allowing you to use AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. Both worked in much the same way to get rid of tearing and stuttering from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches. So overall, I really think this monitor ticks quite a lot of boxes. Really, it's very subjective. People always have to weigh things up for themselves, but the colour performance was really quite vibrant overall. I don't think anyone would describe it as washed out unless they're viewing the screen from a really obscure angle. Contrast performance, that was a definite strength of this monitor. It didn't have any real weaknesses in that respect. It was certainly strong enough to provide a decent atmosphere to dark scenes. And the responsiveness, just some slight issues. So if you're happy enough with the 60 hertz monitor and you like the sound of this resolution, the screen size, all this kind of thing, then this is a really good choice. I was actually a lot more impressed with this model than I was with the flat alternatives to this using the Inlux panel. And the, in particular, the color shift wasn't as bad on this. This felt that overall it had a bit of an edge in image quality. The responsiveness was a bit better as well, actually. I wouldn't say monitors using the Inlux panel are particularly weak in that respect for VA models, but really I do think this one just edges out the flat competition in many respects. So that's really all there is to the Philips 328E1CA. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.